Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to tonight's event, Beyond the Peer-Reviewed Article, Creative Approaches to Research Dissemination. My name is Sonia Boone. I am a professor in the Department of Gender Studies here at Memorial University, and I'm acting director of the Nexus Center for Humanities and Social Sciences Research here. It's a real thrill to be hosting this panel, and I'm delighted you've been able to join us. We are recording this event, and if all tech works out, it will be hosted on the Nexus Center's YouTube channel. I wanted to start by acknowledging the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Beothic. I also want to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut and the Innu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Tonight's event is the result of one of my enduring passions, which is to expand and extend the terrain of what constitutes research. And yet it's not just about my personal passions as much as I'd like it to be. It's also about the politics of research more broadly speaking, what counts as research and who counts as a researcher and what universities value uh, in their faculty and in their students. Overwhelmingly, universities value and prize peer reviewed articles as the pinnacle of research output. The peer reviewed article is seen as the gold standard it is, what, it is what is most valued in tenure, promotion, and indeed prize and award decisions. But it's not the only way to disseminate research. Universities, and our university included, love to share stories about researchers doing cool things. Researchers like the four panelists we have here today who found podcasting networks, write memoirs, novels, work with filmmakers, write op-eds, other forms of journalism, work with artists, and more. These folks and others are doing amazing things. And universities are increasingly interested, as they should be, in celebrating the ways that researchers share their research in more publicly engaged ways, that is, for and with communities beyond the so-called ivory tower. But as much as these kinds of ventures are, ventures are leveraged towards university branding and university promotion, they're not necessarily as well recognized as valuable in terms of career progress. They're seen as add-ons, while the main focus remains the peer-reviewed article. We might also look to uni important university discussions about decolonization and indigenization and about conversations about equity, diversity and inclusion, which are not just happening here, but across the country. Because to be truly meaningful, those conversations must interrogate some of the core philosophical questions at the heart of the university. What does it mean to know? And what does it mean not to know? Who do we count as a knower and why? And who have we not counted as knowers and why? What do we count as research? And why? And what don't we count as research and why? Rethinking what universities value and reward in terms of research outputs must be part of those conversations. So the peer reviewed article is part of the scholarly landscape. It always will be. And in some instances, it's absolutely the best way to share research. But it's premised on very specific ways of understanding what constitutes research and what it means to share that work. What if the peer reviewed article is inadequate to the research stories we want to tell? What if that model, which has become the gold standard, actually undermines the work researchers want to do and the commitments they may hold to community? What if in its form and history, it perpetuates the very exclusions that universities are seeking to undo? What if it actively erases the kinds of stories that need to be told? So how can we tell different stories and how can institutions value those different stories? And what might it mean to move away from the peer reviewed article as a single gold standard upon which so many decisions are made. I'm really excited to introduce you to our four panelists. They're all experts in their various fields and each one of them is a star in their own right. Together, they're incredible. None of them had previously met before our tech rehearsal last week, but within the first 10 minutes, they were on fire. They spoke with passion and exuberance. They were interested in listening and in learning, but also in having conversations. We laughed a lot. It was the best kind of tangle of words, ideas, and personalities, and I know you're in for a treat tonight. So to give you a sense of how the evening's gonna proceed after share, I'm gonna share formal bios of our panelists and introduce some others who are important to tonight's event. And then I'm gonna ask each panelist to introduce themselves and their current fascinations, their current passions. And then we'll move into broad round table session questions. There will be time for audience questions as well. And if you want to ask questions, you can put them into the Q&A, um, which you should be able to see on the right hand side of your screen. If you are not able to use the Q&A or the chat, or if you want to ask differently, you can ask 
uh, to be put to be able to speak your uh, question out loud if you like. At the very end, we have a door prize, which is a work of creative history written by Julia late. Um, I'm going to hold up the book for people who want to see it looks like this. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, she's a Canadian scholar currently based at Birkbeck University of London. Uh, this book, the disappearance of Lydia Harvey, a true story of sex crime and the meanings of justice. Is meticulously research study of early 20th century transnational sex work and sex trafficking written for a general audience. Um, I can tell you as someone who's read the book that it's an engrossing work uh, and very, very interesting work as well. So now to our panelists, who I'm going to introduce in alphabetical order by first name. Um, so our first panelist is uh, Dr. Carrie Ann Leung. It's a fiction writer and educator, holds a PhD in sociology and equity studies from OISE University of Toronto. She is the co-editor with Lynn Caldwell and Daryl LaRue of Critical Inquiries, a reader in Studies of Canada. Her debut novel, The One Press Wu, was shortlisted for the 2014 Toronto Book Awards. And her collection of linked short stories, That Time I Loved You, which looks like this, uh, was released in 2018 by HarperCollins and in 2019 in the US by L Liverite Publishing. It was named as one of the best books of 2018 by CBC. It was awarded the Danuta Glee Literary Award 2019, shortlisted for the Toronto Book Awards 2019, and longlisted for Canada Reads 2019. Carrie Ann is currently working on a new novel titled The After and works at OCAD University in the research office. She talked a bit about this new novel last week, and I really hope she talks about it a bit more in her intro tonight. She's also an accomplished hand embroidery artist who brings images, memories, and stitchery together. It's quite wonderful work. Um, Dr. Cheryl Thompson is our second panelist. She's an assistant professor in creative industries at the Creative School X University. She's the author of Uncle, Race, Nostalgia, and the Politics of Loyalty, and Beauty in a Box, which is where I first encountered her work. Um, and uh, she's currently working on her third book on Canada's history of blackface as performance and anti-black racism. This book is based on research conducted with the assistance of multiple social sciences and humanities research council grants. And the first one will produce an open source resource website and video series. The second is in collaboration with Toronto based film company Pink Moon Studio and together they're co producing a feature documentary film on Canadian blackface. And in 2021, Dr. Thompson Thompson was recipient of an Ontario early researcher award titled mapping Ontario's black archives through storytelling, which aims to catalog Ontario's black archival collections and through ethnographic interviews with the province's creative community collect stories that will come culminate with a public exhibition. In addition to publishing in academic journals, magazines, and newspapers, Dr. Thomas Thompson has also appeared on numerous podcasts and media platforms in Canada and internationally, and in 2021 was named to the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. Our third panelist, Dr. Hannah McGregor, is an assistant professor of publishing at Simon Fraser University, my old alma mater, I'll just point that out, um, where her research is, focuses on podcasting as scholarly communication and on systemic barriers to access in the Canadian publishing industry. She is the co-director of the Amplify Podcast Network, Canada's first peer-reviewed podcast network, and the creator of the network's pilot show, Secret Feminist Agenda, which is fabulous. She's also co-creator of Witch Please, a feminist podcast on the Harry Potter world, the host of the Spoken Web podcast, and the co-editor of the book, Refuse Canlit in Ruins. Her new book, A Sentimental Education, is forthcoming with Wilfrid Laurier University Press in September 2022. She's the author of two recent pieces that I share with numerous grad students and colleagues. So her manifesto in progress, which you can find on her own website, and a short opinion piece that she just published a couple of weeks ago on how saying no can be beautiful, um, which is in the Taiyi online. So welcome. And our final panelist is Dr. Michelle Porter, who people in St. John's likely know already. Dr. Porter is an academic poet and novelist who creates written pieces that reach between and across genres to resist and remake notions of Métis story, place, and home. She's a postdoctoral fellow with the University of Toronto and the 2021-2022 Rupert Slam Centre for Métis Research Fellowship recipient. She also holds three different degrees from Memorial in folklore, geography, and creative writing. Her next nonfiction book, Scratching River, will be published by Wilfrid Laurier, in spring 2022, and I'm thrilled to have been able to follow its journey over the past couple of years. And her first novel will be published by Penguin Canada in spring 2023. She's published nonfiction and poetry. Here's two examples right there. Um, and individual pieces, 
as well. She's a citizen of the Métis Nation and a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation. I also want to introduce four others who are integral to tonight's event, our two ASL interpreters, Heather Crane and Sheila Keats. Our star behind the scenes tech person and one of Nexus Center graduate assistants, Shannon Fraser. Shannon didn't want to be a star, but we wouldn't be having this event if she hadn't put this together online like this. Our second star grad assistant, Sheridan Thompson, who will be live tweeting tonight's event. And for those who are Twitterly inclined, the hashtags that we're using are hashtag Research Week 21 and hashtag Creative Approaches. I wanted to continue by allowing the encouraging, inviting each research reach your participant to share a bit about their current research fascinations, projects, and or processes in about five minutes each, if that works for you. Um, why don't I go reverse alphabetical by first name order? How does that work for you? Which would mean that I would start with Michelle. So. All right. All right. That's great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Sonia, for inviting me and so happy to be um, talking with such um, amazing academics and creatives. It's it's really great to be having this conversation. So um, I've been, um, I started this academic journey actually out as a journalist. So I, I started way back when I got a, a degree in journalism and um, took a, a big break in between there to do that journalism work um, uh, before I came to Newfoundland Labrador and started um, the the uh, graduate degrees. So right uh, right now I'm the uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at University of Toronto working with uh, Dr. Jennifer Adiz who's uh, on on a, a couple of topics in Métis studies. One of them being Métis women's leadership, um, and looking at uh, you know some of those hidden stories, um, some of those you know silence narratives about women's role in um, in uh, political organization. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the Métis homeland. Uh, just to let you all know as well that I'm not uh, either in Toronto or the Métis homeland at the moment. I'm living in Newfoundland and Labrador still at the moment. So, um, and, and academically, I, that, that's the project I'm working on with my, um, you know, with Dr. Jennifer Deese and my own uh, project uh, that I'm heading up on my own uh, that has the support of the Rupert's Land Fellowship. Uh, is uh, focusing on uh, buys and relocation to land and what that means for the Métis Nation, Métis homeland in general. Uh, so, um, my my own interest, um, as well as you know, as, as that uh, other academic work I'm doing, really brings together some of the biological science uh, and looking at what that means to, uh, you know, to to a people and to the future of a nation. Um, creatively, those things all blend together. So. Um, I have started out with poetry. I would say I started with poetry and nonfiction, although I've always felt that um, it was fiction that I really wanted to do uh, in the long term. So my the the book that I have coming out in 2023 with Penguin um, is is such a treat, and it's bringing together all of that research that I have been doing and telling it in a fictional story, uh, which has been an incredible journey to do. Um, the nonfiction I've been doing is a lot of research into my aunt, with my ancestors and figuring out how do you tell these stories, um, the story both of, uh, you know, imagining your ancestors' lives, what they were thinking, what they were doing, their difficulties, what they faced, as well as the journey of finding them and the journey of um, uh, moving ahead with their stories. Um, that's been the focus of my poetry as well as the nonfiction. Um, and I, well, I'd like to hear what, uh, about it from everybody else at, the, at this moment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Actually, I really love hearing about it. Hannah, I'd love to hear from you what you're up to these days. Yeah, what am I up to these days? Um, my big focus these days is the Amplify podcast network. So um, Amplify is a project I'm working on in collaboration with Siobhan McMenemy at Wilfrid Laurier University Press. And it's kind of phase two of a wild idea Siobhan and I hatched at a conference one day um, when she found out I was starting to work in a publishing program. I moved into publishing as a discipline from English and she knew at the time I was making Witch Please and that I was interested in what podcasting might be able to do. I sort of had this wild idea that maybe podcasts could actually be research rather than be just a way that we mobilize research. And Siobhan was um, 
just starting off at Wilfrid Laurier University Press and really wanted to um, direct the press towards doing more experimental publishing. And so we said, well, let's get a small shirt grant and just test that theory out. And so we got a small, you know, an insight development grant. And I had in my mind a sort of, um, well, I'll do something relatively conventional, maybe a five or six part mini series, maybe about Canadian publishing history, because I had just finished a postdoc about the history of a particular middle brow magazine. And then meanwhile, I just started another podcast because um, I was lonely because <laughs> I had just moved to Vancouver and I didn't know anyone. And so I started Secret Feminist Agenda as a very clever excuse to lure interesting women into being my friend. Um, I, I was like, I'll just interview fascinating women doing fascinating things, starting with Zai Yao, who was a postdoc at UBC at the time and just release. I'm just going to plug her incredible new book out with Duke University Press. It's really good. Uh, it's called Disaffected Intimacies. Strong, strong recommend. Anyway, um, so that was a great plan and I suckered a lot of people into being my friends through Secret Feminist Agenda. But maybe like six months into making the podcast, I wrote to Siobhan to pitch what I thought our pilot scholarly podcast would be. And Siobhan said, uh, I thought Secret Feminist Agenda was your scholarly podcast. And I was like, no, Siobhan, that's not scholarly. That's just me, a scholar, speaking to other scholars about our scholarship. That's not scholarship. So, so began a long relationship in which Siobhan has been gradually um, luring me into radicalizing my own understanding of what constitutes the scholarly. Um, and through Secret Feminist Agenda, we piloted a lot of processes. We peer reviewed it. Um, in three seasons, we really experimented with the form and how we wanted to position it in relationship to the press. Um, and Amplify is our second grant uh, that is allowing us to bring three more podcasts into the network um, and put them through their own peer review processes. Podcasts that are about really different topics and scholars with really different kinds of um, community engagements. Uh, and that's also giving us an opportunity to build more of the infrastructure that is necessary to make podcasts work as scholarship because the um, the boring, unsexy piece of transforming what we consider to be research is the infrastructure building. So I'm going to end on that dry note. Thanks so much. I love that you used a podcast as a way to lure people into being friends with you. It really works. I recommend it for everyone. <laughs> uh, Cheryl, how would you describe what it is that you're passionate about at this point? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I have to also give a shout out to Siobhan. I think we we bonded over that because Siobhan also was my editor on Beauty in a Box. So what am I doing? I mean, <laughs> I always kind of laugh a bit when I hear my bio because I'm a very, uh, I'm just a very forward thinking person. So it's like, once I've done one thing, I'm thinking about the next thing and I don't really sit around thinking, oh, remember the time I did that thing? Like, I just don't do that. I'm always like, I did that and now it's next. So, but, so thank you, Sonia, for reading the bio and reminding me that I've actually done a lot of stuff that I should be very proud of, um, which I am. So what am I doing? So a lot of the work, um, when I mentioned, you mentioned in the bio, like the resource uh, website, that's actually now live on Instagram. I'm going to do the thing that all the kids do. I'm plugging my Instagram. It's called Breck underscore archive. So that's B R E C underscore archive. Add the site, check it out. And so what I've done with that research, in addition to all the stuff, like the articles and, and the, the documentary is that in collaboration with one of my grads, uh, not even my grad students, she was in one of my classes and I just was like, that's a talent. Let me connect with that person. And they happen to be a really, thank you. Yes, put that in the chat. Um, they happen to be a really talented graphic designer, like um, digital graphic um, arts and everything. So in working in collaboration with this MA student, we've basically created a digital series <laughs> that is going to be on Instagram, but also on the Breck website itself, which is going to be 
breck.ca when that launches in 2022 that is trying to make the research accessible. So in addition to it, on that website, what you'll see is the video series. So it's going to be a three episode, 10 minute series where I'm basically explaining the history. Yes, thank you. Put that in the chat. Um, explaining the history of blackface. And I always say what, what I'm really trying to do with this work. And by now I've worked with about four, five research assistants is that I'm trying to name it, dismantle it and take the shame out of the facts of this practice that has been around for hundreds of years and trying to get everyone to understand that if you call yourself a person who loves movies, for example, I love movies and I love the theater. Well, you can't love movies in the theater if you don't know blackface, because that's at the root of movies in the theater. And so my project is trying to get, get flush that out to get people to understand that one of the reasons that I believe, you know, when we talk about anti-black racism, I'm not, I'm actually not a scholar of anti-black racism, but what I am a scholar of is racial production and race gets produced in the things that we consume. And so the work that I'm doing and why I think it's so important that I'm trying to create content that is, like you said, Sonia, it's not just the academic journal, right? It's not just the book. It's also digital content is to get people to understand that race gets produced in the things that we consume. And often those things as a form of soft power are very innocuous. Maple, not maple syrup, that's the good stuff. Aunt Jemima syrup, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pancake mix, Uncle Ben's converted rice. Like it's the subtle stuff that we're consuming every day that we're also consuming racial ideology. And so that's what's coming up next. And I'll also plug this. I have a research site that's attached to all my archive work. I don't have that URL yet because it's still in production. But that's going to be the site where when I actually finish the project of mapping Ontario's black archives, that entire catalog will be public access. And my goal is, is to offer that to every archive collection in the province to link to their archive. That again, will provide a public resource. So basically I would have done the work that these archives have never done. I'll just leave it there. As someone who loves and lives for archives, that is the, probably the most exciting part for me. Instagram, it's fun, but honestly, organizing and mapping archives, super important, vital work. And so I'm very excited to see that happening. And our last panelist, Carrie Ann, you want to share with us? I want to hear more about your novel. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll fit that in. Um, so when I was, uh, when we were asked to introduce ourselves, it kind of threw me into this existentialist crisis. <laughs> Because I realize it's always hard for me to fit myself in and ground myself in these contexts because I'm not, I'm no longer, I'm no longer, I'm not an academic per se, right? So I had to go back and journey with me to baby Carrie Ann Scholar doing her PhD. Um, after I finished my PhD, I had a baby and there were no jobs. So that left me with not a lot of choices. But I really mourned um, the loss of my work. And I turned to writing a novel instead because I was just so hungry for an intellectual project. So sleep deprived, I wrote, oh, I also opened up a organic grocery store because I didn't get a um, postdoc. So, you know, all these kind of decisions were determined. So I had a grocery store, I had a baby, and I was like missing research. So I wrote The Wondrous Woo. And I was always, you know, really convinced about literature as knowledge anyway. And so all the things that I was doing in my research was very much carried out in the two novels that came after that. Um, so that was, you know, that was good. And also maybe five people have ever read my academic work, whereas like more than five people have read my novels. So yay me, right? <laughs> um, so since then, like, I kind of run the parameter of academe, like I have been adjunct, I have been an administrator, I'm a writer in residence at three different universities, and I quite like and coming to understand the ways in which my curiosity and my inquiry is, is very, like, unburdened now, because I don't feel I have to fit any discipline or any kind of institutional box. So I like that, even though it's a very precarious life. 
Um, it's, it's, it's something that I really realize now that it really feeds my creative um, energy. So my current project that I'm working on is a new novel that um, I have to write because it was already sold and uh, that's no pressure at all. Um, it's called The After and I thought of it as an apocalyptic fairy tale. Um, I had written some essays, uh, one essay in particular called Writing in a Dangerous Time, where I address this moment of instability and climate catastrophe and all kinds of things. Um, and then I saw, read some of the essays in David Theo Goldberg's um, monograph called Dread, Facing Futureless Futures. And that notion of futureless futures was really something that I really want to think about. So this book is set in the future and it is about what happens if we have no future to think upon. Um, how do we live even if maybe we're dying, right? So those were questions that were really um, pressing, but it's also a really funny book <laughs> given that because it is this negotiation of not just our human relationships, but human and non-human kinds of life forms. So there's a raccoon in it. And like some of my research these days is like, I honestly wrote a raccoon sex scene where I went to YouTube and like watched all kinds of raccoons having sex. So that's not something I did in my PhD. So that all that is also fun. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm really happy to be here with this esteemed panel. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. And I will say that I am one of those five people who's read your academic work, and I'm sure it's more than five anyway. And in fact, I have cited it as well. Um, but I also like your call out five people have read my academic work. How many people have read my novels? Right? So thinking in terms of where does scholarship travel? Who gets to read it? How do they access it and why? Also important as well. Um, so I have I have a bunch of general questions that I would love to broach with you. And what I would do is I will ask the question and I'll lead it to one of you. And then after that, um, you are welcome to jump in as you like to contribute to that question or to converse with the other person who started the question. If you could, when you're answering the question, um, just put your hand up so that our ASL interpreters know who the next person is that's speaking. They should give them a little bit of time to adjust as well. And I know your voices, but the audience may not quite yet know your voices either. So um, I guess my first question, the most general question probably is, as everybody's heard, you're all are involved in a whole range of different projects. Um, and some of you have already talked about how you came to those diverse ways of working. Um, what would you think, looking at the more, um, looking at say your podcast, looking at say the development of videos and websites, looking at novels, how would your work be different if you had taken more traditional approaches in those things? And what do you think that your, the approaches you have chosen to take contribute to scholarly thinking, conversation, and more? And I'm going to shoot that one to Hannah to start. <laughs> I mean, it's a very funny question because I don't think I'd have an academic career if I hadn't wandered into making a podcast. Um, my postdoc, I mean, I loved my postdoctoral research, but it was about the history of early 20th century middle brow magazines published out of the prairies. And that, like, I, I went on the job market with that work and people were like, very seriously being like, so tell us more about why your work is so boring. <laughs> All right, fun. Um, but I just, you know, I started Witch Please with a friend largely because not unlike how Carrie Ann was talking about, you know, having a baby and, and opening an organic grocery store, we were like, well, there's no jobs. And so the attempt to like take a traditional career route seems very silly because it mostly requires you to do extraordinarily boring things. Um, and often in my experience to sort of squish down your values quite a lot in order to sort of fit into the institution. And we thought, okay, well, let's just do the thing that we would do if we didn't care about getting a job. Let's just do the thing that we actually want to do. And what we wanted to do is drink two bottles of wine and shout about gender and Harry Potter, like as it turned out. Um, 
And what that did for me is like some very real things in the sense of it opened out to me the fact that there is a significant audience for scholarly work when it is offered in mediums that people can actually access and in mediums that invite people into conversation and that take seriously the things that people care about. Um, so that was a sort of revelation to me. I'd always assumed being a literature scholar that my work was for five people tops if I was lucky. Um, and so that was kind of surprising to make a podcast and find out that actually lots more people wanted to talk about like how you read. Um, and I, I hadn't realized that. But I also realized that doing work that is values first rather than career first is deeply joyful for me. And that considering the profound precarity of academia, it made a lot more sense to do work that felt good and joyful and felt like it was putting the kinds of things into the world I wanted to than to do work that was constraining and conservative um, in the hopes of a uh, career that wasn't particularly likely anyway. Um, so podcasting kind of radicalized me, I guess, is what I'm saying. That's awesome. Anybody else want to contribute to that question? How would you, how would your work be different? Because we've got Hannah who says, well, I wouldn't even be an academic without it. Cheryl. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's like, I just, because I, before I became an academic, I actually worked professionally for about eight years in, in three different fields. And one of those fields, I was a financial reporter for a, a, a newswire service that was essentially the early, they were early digital platform, like, like pre Bloomberg kind of thing. Like they were literally doing work. So this was like the mid two thousands or so. And I think that's probably where it came from for me to have this itch to always create digital content, knowing how it can circulate and how, when you create that digital content, it also, it also never really goes away. <laughs> I think I was, it, my ego was looking for permeancy. <laughs> if I just could be honest with you, whereas, you know, the academic writing and, and I should be clear, I still do academic writing. I still publish probably 2 or 3 peer reviewed journal articles a year. So I'm still able to do that. And I think it's because I worked professionally as a journalist. Like I just have a, I have a certain like proficiency <laughs> with like just getting the mechanics of what's required to write a peer review article. Right. And then after I write that peer review article, I'm always like tucking stuff away. I'm talking like the good stuff that I could actually share with people. <laughs> like once I get the technical thing out of the way. So I think for me. You know, I would still be doing what I'm doing, but just, it's just the way I am. I, I can't be contained within the boundaries of academia. I kind of really related to what um, Carrie Ann was saying. It's like, I can't, it's like academia has such a, it's such a framework, right? It's like, it's such a tight framework, even academic articles, like how you need to structure it. I remember I submitted something uh, several months ago and it got terribly rejected. It was like every reviewer was like this. If they, if they knew it was me, <laughs> they, they might have been a little less harsh. It was like, this is not even up to the standard. This person, where's the lit review? They went through the technical things. And the whole time I was thinking, gosh, that's why I I submitted this because I didn't want to do that. Like I was trying to get out of doing the thing that they want to put you in the box to do. And I was basically sent the message. Don't do that. Stay in the box because the box is what we understand. So for me, all the other outlets that I've chosen to disseminate my work, it has a lot to do with that. It has a lot to do with this box that we're, we're told we have to fit in and I will fit in it to to meet the requirements, but I couldn't stay in it permanently. I think it would be like, to Hannah's point, it would be soul crushing if like that was my only outlet, a journal article. <laughs> I just, you know, I just can't. So I think, I think what's important for people watching this, I think is to, is to get, glean that you can do that. Like you have a choice. And I, and I just, I've always exercised my choices when it comes to like how I disseminate my work. 
I have to say you're all you're you're my people, man. Because I have to say if I can only do if I can only do peer reviewed articles, soul crushing, soul crushing, completely soul crushing. So uh, you're absolutely my people, and we're besties forever, right? We talked about this last week. So Michelle, you wanted to add something? Yes, yes, I wanted to talk about that that box that that uh, that that came up. Um, the idea of you know sending that 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 peer review or, or that article out, and and the peer reviewers returning to it with that doesn't have this literature review, it doesn't fit these specifications. And I, I think that that has so much to do with the need to be able to feel like they can evaluate and then sort of control, to control what knowledge is and what's in that box of knowledge. And so for me, in, in a lot of what I'm doing, it's really about um, recognizing different the different knowledge systems and the different um ways the different kinds of uh genres for me in which in which knowledge can exist and so you know you ask what would you know what would um you know with, without academia or you know in a different sense what what would um uh, i have and or what do i bring to it it's it's, it's story really i feel like i feel like academia is a story and it's a very set story and it's and, and they're repeating story in a certain way, but that, um, a, a, and there's almost a, a denial that, that it's stories that they're telling in some ways, um, but that um, being able to work with, with, with uh, academic knowledge and pull it into a kind of story that I feel like recognizes the past, the present and the future all at once and pulls out these timelines instead of being constrained. And I mean, I'd like to think of it of that whole seven generations back, seven generations ahead thinking that not all stories do, but that you can build into the stories and build into thinking about, you know, your ancestors, but thinking about what's coming ahead and um, send that off into the world. And, and, and I feel like that that's something I can do so much more powerfully in, whether it's poetry, nonfiction or, or, or um, uh, fiction. Great, thank you for that. I was just looking over at the Q and A because somebody has asked a question in the Q and A, so I'm going to ask that person's question. Um, somebody says, "I'm loving this discussion. I am about to put two little kids to bed, but I was hoping to raise the following issue: Hannah's comments about breaking her isolation by reaching out to scholars and people she wanted to know more about resonate. Academia is so isolating, which makes it so relevant to talk and engage with people outside of our immediate scholarly niche. How did you each decide?" Who you wanted your non academic audience to be um, and what tools are most appropriate to reach out to them. So this is actually a question from Isabel Cote, who was the previous director of the Nexus Center um, and is currently on sabbatical. We'll move back next year. So who wants to answer that? How did you decide who you wanted your non academic audience to be and what tools and how do you decide what tools are most appropriate to reach out to them? Take that one up. I mean, can I just say quickly, the, all I have to say is they choose me. Yes. Yes. I, I, feel, I was just going to say the same thing. Like, I don't actually choose. I, I just feel like I need to. You know, do what I do and put it out there and then the people will come. <laughs> no, um. It's it's that kind of thing where that community, you know, it, you know, writing fiction. It's it's like you know, even in terms of like what gets published, what doesn't get published, you know, because it's all about marketing and what is what is able to sell. But my my stance is that readers are made by what comes out, right? So it's not as if there's this like demographic of readers. A book makes a readership, and um, and so I think you know back to the point of there's just so many ways of telling. And I think those of us on the panel have so many tools in front of us. At, it just depends on what you wanna say and how to say it. I get to pick, right? And, and maybe like I say all the same things, but on all these different kinds of medium. So I think that's how I think of it. Great, thanks. Anna, you wanted to add a Michelle too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love the way that, that Carrie Ann put that because I think a lot of what we're doing when we work publicly is that we are creating publics, right? And that's what sort of non-traditional publishing does is it creates non-traditional publics. And there's a beautiful long history of that in publishing, right? Zine making is about counter publishing and creating the space for these counter publics. And, 
you know, podcasting does that, poetry does that, storytelling does that, videos do that. Like, you know, we're all, we're all sort of building the space for these publics. There's always this question for me of what is the difference between the people who happen to find my work and the community to whom I feel accountable? Because that's increasingly for me a, a really vital question as I work in genres that that not only are public, but that really explicitly invite responsiveness um, because podcasts have a lot of responsiveness built into them. And like increasingly, like with which please, half our guests these days are former listeners and like horrifyingly, it's not horrifying, it's awesome and I'm lucky, but increasingly also our guests are people who started listening to our podcast when they were students and who are now professors and are like, oh yeah, your podcast shaped my sense of what a scholar can be, which made me feel happy and old at the same time. Um, but the distinguishing between the people who happen to find the work and the people who, when they respond to the work, I am accountable to them because I'm accountable for how my work moves in the world is a, is a decision. So it's like, it's not like I'm finding my people, but I am developing a sense of who I answer to as part of that process. That's a really interesting way of putting it. You're, right when you started, when you said, when we work publicly, we create publics. And in that sense, you're also thinking actively about um, what that process is like. Um, go Michelle first and then Cheryl. Okay, well, I, I just, everything everybody else said, I could say too, <laughs> for sure. But I also uh, just wanted to add to it how I, um, I, and during my PhD, I, I was so excited and delighted to discover this thing called writing as a research method. <laughs> and um, when I when I dug deep in it, I really found that um, for me, my process, some people think and then write. I'm thinking, I think through something by writing. And it kind of answered a lot of questions perhaps I may have had at the PhD level where I was thinking, why, why do certain things work for other people? And I'm not sure until I've written. So in a sense, my the act of writing for me is making sense, trying to make sense of the knowledge, trying to make the knowledge. The actual writing is making the knowledge. And, and in some ways I'm writing um, what it is that I would might have wanted to read on that on that topic and in that way. Um, and and as for the tools, to me, I mean, it just depends on what you're how you're wanting to play with with the knowledge, uh, whatever, however you're framing it. Um, it, 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 it in, in some ways, I do find sometimes in fiction, um, I can be truer <laughs> than, you know, in, in nonfiction. Um, and that in poetry, there's this um, truth that comes from obscuring certain things at times. So it's it's the the genres are the for me, those are the tools that 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 I work with because I don't have the podcast and I don't have the visual art, but um those are those. So thank you for that. I am also someone who thinks through writing and uh outlines don't make sense to me for an awfully long time because I first have to write the whole thing and then I'm oh this is how it works. So Cheryl, you had a. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, a lot of my journey has been just through discovery. You know, like I, I, when I when I went to McGill to do my PhD, I I knew that my like the topic has the topic was beauty culture. Like that actually never changed. What changed through discovery was how I was going to tell that story and how I was going to explore that topic, and and what I realized and and I and. What I realize is that I what I do is that I tend to give people the book that they didn't know that they needed until I gave it to them <laughs> or I give them the topic. Like when I started studying blackface, nobody was that was in hushed tone. <laughs> like nobody would talk about that. That was the big, big secret at the archive was that we have these materials and through producing works. And I feel like just putting it out into the ether it's kind of nudged people to to speak about it. So for me, part of the audience, I almost look at it like therapy. <laughs> when you share your story of whatever it is, you're actually freeing someone else to share their story that could be connected. And so 
I, I and it's it's kind of very ironic for me because when I was an undergrad, I actually I minored well. I say I minored in psychology, but I was one credit short. So technically I didn't get the minor, but I was very interested in psychology. And I thought that's, I thought it was something that I might want to pursue. Right. And I never really did. And understand, I also have an undergraduate degree in criminology. <laughs> so I also <laughs> thought, I also thought I was going to go like kind of in the legal, I think I wanted to be a lawyer that I was going to be like, and then CSI came out. So then I thought, oh, naturally I'm going to be like a forensic investigator. And here we are 20 years later. And if I don't essentially do that, but with history and culture and and objects and 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 the visual culture, right? I'm basically everything I said I wanted to do, like taking those two fields of psychology and forensics, I've just through discovery managed to implement them into something else. And I think that's what people have to realize. Take what you're interested in and then think about how you can discover things around you that just interest you. You don't have to give up anything is what I'm saying. Often people think as they go through the academic journey, they have to just like, if you're really interested in science, but then you end up going into art history, somehow you have to give up the science. Actually, you don't. There's a whole visual culture of science that you can now take and use your art history knowledge and science and bring it together. So I think that's what I've learned to do. And and to, and to, and I think it when you, when you learn to do that, you get out of this idea of what academia is. Because actually, I don't know what academia is. <laughs> I only know the academia that I live in, and it's very nice. Thank you for that, Cheryl. And actually, your point that you made there, when you share, you free others to share their stories as well. When you share, share and it makes me think we're just uh, in one of my classes. We're reading. Mona El Tahawi, Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. And that's one of the things she says too. If I share my story, and she works, she does the hashtags on social media. If I share my story, I make room for other people to feel comfortable sharing their stories as well. So, very important aspect there. Um, we have another question from Amy Richards, who says, One of the things I don't like about an academic career is this idea of marketing yourself so that the more articles you publish, the more grants you get funded for, et cetera, and the higher your marketability. Is the same true? Oops, everything slid up. This way is the same true with how you all engage with scholarship. Do you feel that pressure in terms of marketing yourself in terms of uh, pushing for grants, that kind of thing? How do you feel about that? And then I'll take that 1 on. Cheryl, I'll just say very quickly. And you might laugh at this example, but I, I think it's the best example I could come up with in the moment. If you were having a yard sale. Would you promote the yard sale? And you probably would because you want people to come and buy the things that you have for sale. <laughs> so to me, that's what happens in academia. It's when I look at myself, I'm actually not trying to market myself. I'm trying to market my work because I want people to come and read the work because I put so much labor and time and energy and love into producing the work. Me as a person, I'm by proxy marketed, but in my mind, that's actually not what I'm trying to do. I am literally always trying to focus on what I'm producing so that people will come and see it and, and engage in it. If you engage in it, and by the way, you like me as a person, I just see that as an extra, not my goal. Michelle. Well, I, I could, I could say that, um, you know, there's different different people go about both their academic careers differently, um, and they go about their, their writing careers differently. And um, there's room for all kinds of approaches, um, and um, and all kinds of audiences and all kinds of numbers of audiences. Uh, but um, uh, depending on how you how a person takes their balances their academic and their writing career. You can do different things. You get an agent. If you get with a publisher who does uh, marketing, it's not something that you have to, um, you know, as as you build up a career, it's not something that you have to take on on your 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 own. You can get a lot of support for it. Um, as somebody who's probably not as comfortable with um, the idea of you know uh, putting a bunch of marketing into things, however, because I write books. 
that's that's something that the, the the publisher does take on and or support people. So there's lots of different ways to to get um, all that stuff out there. And and I in my experience I would have felt that you know um, you know the jostling for you know academic article space is very different uh, than you know let's say um, come read my book. Um, come read my, you know, my story or my nonfiction book or or the novel that I've written. I will say, Michelle, when you said I'm not comfortable with this, if you ever want to find out what's happening in Michelle's world, you follow her partner because he posts when she's got exciting things on the go. How did I find out that Michelle had a book deal? I found out because I follow him too. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to find cool things that you have proxies who do this for you, if you're not comfortable sharing your own sort of things, but I also like Cheryl's point too, that it's not just the work that you do, it's the love you put into your work, right? Because the work that we produce is the work, it comes from who we are as inside people. It's not just a gig, right? It comes from our passions as well. And I think that that's a really important point to make. Hannah, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm just trying to formulate it in my head because I'm thinking about like trade versus scholarly publishing and this thing we do in scholarship where once the article has been accepted, you immediately forget it ever happened. Um, you're just like, cool, article is done, dead to me now, moving on, right? Whereas like your publisher probably, even if they don't want you to do the marketing, they would like you to remember your book exists for a little while, maybe tell some people about it, maybe do a reading. So there is this sense that like, when you are doing non-traditional work, you're like a little bit more engaged in the circulation of it. And I know for some scholars I've talked to that they find that idea really off putting because it does feel like branding yourself, marketing yourself, putting yourself out there. Um, and, and some people I think have rightly pointed out that if we get too reductive about how impact equals importance with public scholarship, that becomes its own kind of slippery slope into um, as I always say, Jordan Peterson being the most important scholar working in Canada. Because he's getting the most YouTube hits. So, so it can't be just impact and it can't be like, we can't let it get sucked into this like neoliberal university project of like just another branding thing, just another impact metric, just another way to make us all hustle harder. Um, and I, th I think you know, a big part of that is exactly what, what Cheryl was saying, which is that, like, you love the work, like, not the labor, but like the thing, like that you want to be creating things that you love so that you are excited to share them and put them out in the world. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's wonderful. Carrie Ann, as someone who's working basically entirely outside of traditional scholarly frameworks, how do you feel about but you work with researchers and artists. How do you feel about this notion of marketability and the kinds of marketing that you're involved with and the kinds of work that you do now in relation to what everybody else has said? I, I mean, I was just in, gonna echo what everybody else said. Like we live in the, we live within these neoliberal systems. These things are in place and you can try to figure out ways to get what you need so you can keep doing the work. But I guess, you know, I, I don't want to be a star. Like, I just want, I, I do love my work and I want to keep doing the work that I love. And, you know, I'm teaching in the MFA program at Guelph in, um, and I get emerging writers always asking me about, they're so concerned about their social media and what they're supposed to do to brand themselves. And, and I'm like, it's just so insincere if you see yourself as a brand. Like, you know, I, I'm just such, I'm an exhibitionist anyway. So, like, you know, I'm kind of that mom who posts like 10 Instagram posts a day because I don't care. I just like my little snappy snaps, you know? So, like, if you just be yourself and just go and do what you want to do, I think that that is probably going to resonate with more people if that's what you want. If your your point is connection, then just just be yourself. I mean, that sounds so cliche, but it really is. It's like, what are you wanting to perform here? You know, and to what ends? Cheryl and then Michelle, sorry. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Like, 
for myself, I cannot tell you how when I have I've had some people who were like, "Oh, Cheryl, you're a rock star." Can we unpack rock star? Okay, like what does that even mean? It's like first of all, if if I'm a rock star, am I a white man wearing tight jeans with long hair in 1987? Because that's my image of rock star, right? Like Def Leppard is what you're referring me to, and I got a problem with that. And I keep thinking to myself, why don't you ever call me an inspiration? Because that's how I view myself. Why don't you call me a role model, right? Instead, you're calling me a star. And so I actually think sometimes what happens is that we get these labels put on us when we get a, a public profile. And, and, and that's not who I am. I'm actually the same person I was when I started at McGill University in 2009, okay? I really am the same person. It's just that I have I have bigger stuff. It's just like the celebrity, if they are an honest person, is the same person just with better sheets. The, the thread count is much better. <laughs> That's what's changed. But everything else about you is essentially the same. So part of this game is also disconnect from the labels that people want to put on you because your profile might be what they think it is, right? And and often I've 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 maintained my sense of self as I've become more known in academia because that has nothing, the image has nothing to do with me, is what I'm saying to you. I understand that it's part of a, a production process, right? to all the points that have been made. Publishers need to sell books, so they need to promote you. They need to create a little image for you. And every time you give a talk, just like this one, you get a nice little headshot. And then there's a bio that gets read, and then they have the social media going. So you get created into an image. That doesn't mean that you have to absorb that as part of your identity. And I think that's a healthy distance to have from the public self and your private self. I think Cheryl, you, you walk from garage sales on one end to high thread count on the other and occupying a space that is that vast really in terms of how others construct you and how you understand yourself right from the garage. sale, which may have high thread count sheets for all, you know, or the celebrity with a high thread count is, is quite fantastic. Michelle, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about the, I mean, she talked about the public self and the private self, but I think the academic self and the creative self. And each of us here seems to have different relationships with academia and with the creative. And um, it struck me that because I've just got my first book, novel book deal, and, you know, I have that wonderful book with Wilfred Laurier coming out just in the spring. So I'm kind of just emerging in a bigger way as a creative person that it's the first time I've been experiencing this bigger divide in the bio I'm giving in different places. So who am I in this one place and how do I play my academic? Um, you know, in some bios, academics are at the bottom if they're even mentioned. And in other bios, the academics is the first thing. Um, so for me, I'm having negotiating now this space between the creative and the academic in my in my life that's really um at sometimes it's 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 comfortable but sometimes i'm trying to figure it out and then maybe i have a question for all of you how is that how are you each negotiating those spaces if you want to answer that <laughs> diane hannah i just want to just very briefly because i'm a podcaster and a scholar and what's very funny to me is that in the scholarly space People are very excited and keen about the podcasting, but in the podcasting space, people are like, who is this bitch? Like, couldn't, so, so uninterested. And I, one time was at this like schmoozy podcasting meet and greet. So like a lot of white men in skinny jeans and very expensive shoes, um, which is what podcasters look like. Um, and uh, I was being introduced by some, you know, important podcast person. And I was like, I'm going to try. I'm going to just try a thing. So I was like, hi, yeah, I'm Hannah McGregor. I uh, run Canada's first scholarly peer-reviewed podcast network. Uh, and he did this. He shook my hand and he went, good for you. And then walked away. And I was like, no, nope, no, I give up. I give up immediately. I am never trying again. I am done forever. So that's me in the podcasting space. 
it's, it'd be interesting to see how, what kind of bio do you put forward and how people respond to that, which relates to Cheryl's point about how you're constructed by others. Cheryl. Yeah, and another point is that, I don't know, do we have to choose? I, I've never been one of the, I, I, I've just never been one of those persons who thinks you have to choose anything like uh, that you, or that you even have to give up anything that instead you find some combination that works for you. So I, I sort of, I kind of always actually, <laughs> I'm one of those lazy people. I give the same bio. <laughs> all the time. Like, I actually get in the bio and say, you know what you figure out, you pick the parts that you like, I just leave it to them because I, I don't have the time to, to cut and slice myself up. And, and lo and behold, often the, it's true. It's like, what gets presented will be different every time. <laughs> like they will pick the parts that they think is relevant to whatever it is, but I've just never felt like I had to um, deny any part of my bio, except I rarely tell anyone that I was a claims adjuster. Like, I don't put that into the bio. <laughs> it just doesn't seem relevant <laughs> anymore. <laughs> You just well, added it. <laughs> yeah. So that claims adjusting, no, that doesn't work for the grant. But I do tend to everything I've done in my scholarly work, even the non academic stuff, I just kind of put it all in and say, decide like you, you know, and, and that's my own choice in doing that. Recognize that what I'm basically saying is that I'm allowing someone else to produce my image for whatever it is that they need me for. So that is me giving them that power. And I'm okay with it. But, but it, it's only, it only works when you're okay with it. And I think it's just about people being okay with what they're willing to give up and, 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 and also being okay with maybe other people molding you into something. And if you're not okay with that, then set a boundary and say, well, actually, this is how I want to be presented. So part of this is actually just speaking up for yourself and feeling like you have agency in the process as you become more known through the works that you're doing. Ariane. This is why your question of introducing ourselves threw me in, into the existentialist angst because I, um, it's, you know, I don't see it as a big convergence, but being a fiction writer and being an academic seems to throw other people, you know, into confusion. And um, so, you know, I'm mostly just known as a writer now um, and that's sad to me, you know, because it's like, if I hadn't done the PhD, I may not have gotten to the fiction. Right? So, but they don't see those connections, um, in the 1 body that I live, which is a very seamless experience actually. So I think, um, yeah, you can't really, you know, I'll use different bios for different reasons because I have to, like, I'm going to go to a, a literary festival. They're not going to care about my academic work, but they may think it's kind of weird that I'm, I have a PhD and then they'll ask me questions about it so that they can make sense of me. Right. Um, whereas academics are like, they tell me all the time. Oh, my God, I just really wanted to be a fiction writer and I ended up as an academic, <laughs> which is hilarious. Right? Because it's like, you can do all of it. Um. So, yeah, I, I get that, but it's also, you know, I also have, um, you know, what Cheryl is saying is that I just, you can't also control how people read you, you in as your body or your work actually. Right. And so I'm not so concerned about those things anymore. I just kind of show up. And just go blah, this is me. <laughs> I love your point that you make there that, uh, you know. Some people don't see the relevance of the PhD in relation to the literature, but you say yourself, having not, if you hadn't done the PhD, you may not have become the writer that you are now. So thinking about how those various elements of who we are as researchers and as creatives and how they inform one another. So for example, for myself, my background is in classical music. I would not be the, the, the researcher that I am without the fact that I'm always thinking of the fact that I'm a flute player first. Like that's just, that's just first, that's always there. It informs how I see everything, right? Um, we've got a whole bunch of questions and comments in the Q and a, um, I'm going to see 1 person has to leave. And so I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say, share their comment, which is, this is our, uh, Dean right now. Dr. Elsa Craig, who says, thank you to the panelists for this invigorating discussion. I'm sorry. I'm not able to stay, but I wanted to let you know how valuable I find this discussion to be. Thank you. All of you. Um, I'm going to move 1 up from there, which is that uh, 1 person says here, and I think you're all working with students in different sorts of ways, or at least 3 of, of you are. 
Um, one of you said, one person says this is Jack Camp says, those of you who work with students, how has your work interest and awareness of creative methods of scholarly communication impacted what content you put on a syllabus and the sorts of projects you assign or what possibilities do you see opening up for students in how you shape their educational experiences? Who wants to start with that one? Anna. I can just jump in and say that being somebody who, who has stopped working in traditional essays liberated me to stop assigning traditional essays. Um, I, to read, yes, but even more importantly, to write. Um, you know, the essay I came up, I learned to teach in English as a discipline, and you assign the essay, but you also teach students how to write the essay. And it was a real challenge for me when I moved to publishing, because the norm continues to be write an essay, as it is in many disciplines, but I wasn't teaching people how to write essays anymore. And I was really confused <laughs> because I was like, well, I'm grading you on something I'm not teaching you that seems unfair and then i realized after a year or two that i didn't have to assign essays that i could in fact use the course as an opportunity to encourage students to do what i am doing all the time which is to ask yourself what is the medium that is most appropriate to communicate the things you're interested in communicating okay let's let's play with that and so I really love letting students make whatever they want to make as long as they can have a conversation with me about why they think that's the appropriate thing to make. And my favorite example of this is um, in the history of publishing graduate seminar that I take, I bring students to special collections so that we can spend time with historical published objects. Um, and get used to their materiality and think about the ways that their materiality shapes their ability to move through the world. And then the students have to adopt an object, research it, and then remediate it into a new form that moves it through the world otherwise in a way that they think is appropriate. And they make the wildest things. Like they turn 19th century um, etiquette manuals into card games. They like, they just, and so when you say like, I don't care what you make, I just want you to have an argument for how what you make is appropriate to the thing you are trying to do they just they make more fun stuff and then i get to grade fun stuff i get to grade fun stuff is i think my mantra yeah. um when i assign things i i want i want to grade fun stuff and students are so amazing at creating fun stuff like they're really great when you let them go cheryl yeah i mean i really tailor what the assignments are to the topic. So I teach a variety of courses in some of those courses. I still think a traditional essay is, it, it, they're gonna get more out of a traditional essay than if, if I were to give them something else because they really wanna like dive into a topic and like really probe it. And they, they can't do that in, in certain other forms. But in other classes, I've had people, like for example, I'm teaching an advertising theory and practice course for that course, they work as a team and they essentially produce a, uh, an ad, <laughs> basically. Like in teams throughout the 12 weeks, they learn the elements of ad design and all the stuff. And then working in a team, the, the big capstone is that you create three minutes that is almost like a strategy of what an ad would look like, but you have to engage with both text uh, video and audio. So it's, it's using all their skills of like, design that they would that they learn in the program in another course it's an intro course i scrapped the essay altogether i haven't taught an essay in that course in a couple of years and what they do is they they do directed paraphrases where i basically say here's here are all the concepts you've learned weeks one through nine pick five of these concepts and direct the and paraphrase to, to an audience and you have a list of audiences to pick from. So I'm basically training them how to absorb information, relay it back, and then gear it toward a specific type of people to know that not everybody's gonna receive information the same way. And what I've learned in being creative in course design and, and um, assignments is that when you do that, everything in the course makes sense. <laughs> when you just do the cookie cutter to Hannah's point, every class, it's an essay. It's like, what well, does it make sense in this class? 
for example, one of my courses in the winter semester, yeah, there is no essay. Actually, there's no essay, there's no midterm, there's no final. <laughs> they just have a series of assignments that are actually related to something. And I just think, you know, professors have to kind of stop being lazy because I think some of this is just, as we would say in my culture, culture lazy man work <laughs> that we need to really stop doing and put some effort into the creativity of course design to use that word because i think courses can you could be really creative with how you teach and even though pedagogy seems so structural to go you know, carry on you know more about this being at Oise, but it's like pedagogy seems so like uh just pedantic the truth is it could be very creative you could look at it like a, a painter who has a canvas like, that's how I look at course design and I, and I think I wish more young grad students as they came through the, the cycle were being taught to think about course design in that way. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I thinking too of, of just how it is that we. Thinking your, your assignment around audiences, I think, is really important because you do tell a concept and to say you have to tell that to a bunch of 10 year olds very different from how you would tell it in other ways. Uh, we had a collaborative blog for one of my courses once and one student discovered halfway through term that her grandmother and all her grandmother's bridge friends in Nova Scotia were reading the blog every week as well. And then they actually changed their writing because they imagined a different, it wasn't just this amorphous sort of generic people out there. It was grandma and grandma's bridge friends who were reading this feminist blog, um, which changed how they approached it. So thinking about that is great. Carrie Ann, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I teach, so I teach fiction now, um, and what I do is I insert sociology into teaching craft. <laughs> so I'm doing it the other way. Um, I'm teaching a course right now on decolonial fiction. So I approach the text like I would approach Canada, is that how do you decolonize this text? What are the ways in which you could break it open, unravel it, tell it differently, tell it slant? Um, how do you undo the very thing that it's supposed to be? Um, so I, I assign theory um, because I just think, you know, craft is one thing, the elements of craft as we know them in conventional, you know, Eurocentric novels, but also then we read a whole bunch of other, um, you know, indigenous and racialized writers and really study the ways in which they're really um, making ruptures in the form. Right? So that's um, kind of how, see again, it's like, it's to me, it's my convergence of nothing is wasted. Everything makes sense to me in one place. Um, and so that also guides my pedagogy. So you're creating sociologists by stealth in some sort of <laughs> way. <laughs> Michelle, did you want to add anything to this conversation? Well, I've, um, I'm not teaching at the moment, but I have been teaching um, journalism classes, actually. Um, and um, there's, I found them to be, I, I a little bit, a couple of academic classes here and there earlier, but when I went in to teach journalism classes, those students were so radically different. And some of my approach ended up, I think, echoing what Carrie Ann has to say is that, you know, these students were so hungry to, to go out in the world um, right away in a way that um, um, uh, isn't always mirrored in, in all your, in all the academic students you may have, depending on how the class is made up. And I'm speaking um, undergraduate here. And um, so I was bringing in, okay, some, here are some research methods that are helpful and you have your journalistic research methods, but I actually would bring in, you know, here's, here's different ways of thinking about things. Here's more of a, you know, here's, here's a way to, uh, to, to structure uh, some of the thinking. So in a, in a sense, I had these incredibly creative, really eager and critical thinkers, but, but, but not quite formed yet. So. I brought some of that into these. I snuck some of that into the journalism classes. So, um, and and while keeping assignments a little bit, keeping the assignments uh, uh, very much that each student could pursue the uh, you know the topic in in their in their own way within within the parameters of journalism. So it was you know a, a, a mix of that. But I found I just I really liked how Carrie Ann put it. This sneaking a little bit of of the sociology and to um, these creative classes was really effective. 
I like how all of you are basically finding ways to to weave different things together. It isn't ever just one thing. It comes, they come together. Different parts of you co coalesce also in your pedagogies as the way through. Um, I've got a question from John Sandlos, who says, sometimes I worry that podcasts, films, blogs, and magazine articles I've done still reach roughly the same academic audience as my peer-reviewed work. Does the public engagement work really reach the public? I'm going to direct that. I'm going to start that with Hannah because you do the most, uh, perhaps the most obviously public work as a podcaster. Yeah, it's definitely reaching a public for sure. Um, and not all of it and not all in the same way. Um, that's part of it, right? So I have made three podcasts. Um, one of them is uh, like a co-hosted sort of chat style podcast about Harry Potter. That reaches the largest audience because it takes a form that is um, already well established within the world of podcasting. It takes up a topic that has significant interest and engagement from non academic audiences and all of the norms around how we publish it and promote it come from the world of podcasting. So it's often scholarly and content, but in terms of all of the ways we are thinking about making it and reaching audiences, we are following. The logics of podcasting. Secret feminist agenda had a smaller audience because it was a more clearly scholarly project in a lot of ways. Um, it still was reaching non academics, but a lot of those non academics came from which place to secret feminist agenda. That's often how they arrived at it. Um, and then the spoken web podcast, you know, has the smallest audience of those because it is really explicitly associated with a particular research project. And so it is generally reaching the people who are already interested in that research project. I don't consider one of those projects to be more successful than another because they are doing different kinds of work and they are. They are reaching different kinds of publics and not all publics are the same size or the same shape, but. One of the big takeaways for me is that if you really do want to reach people who are not academics, you can't take traditional academic work and try to just shove it into other forms. You've got to actually really understand and embrace how those forms work and what people want in those forms. Um, I love that notion of that the publics are different. They're not necessarily more or less important. They're just very different. And also this notion that the, you have to, the work has to shape itself in conjunction with the form that you choose to create for it. Cheryl, it looked like you wanted to say something about this. Oh, um, no, but I will say something since you called on me. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, it, for, with me, I, I've I've heard from people from so many far and wide places that said that they oh I read your work I'm like really in Germany, like in English, <laughs> like so you just never know. For me, I just again I just don't try to control the public. I you I put the work out there, it circulates, and then whoever it is. But I think to the question, it's the idea that you've maybe done some tracking and you've noticed that it's kind of the same people who seem to be, you know. Um, catching on to what you're doing. And I think, well, maybe is, is that okay? <laughs> I feel like we live in a time where everyone keep always has, they're obsessed with growing their audience and like audience outreach. And what if it's the same 10 people? At least they're loyal. <laughs> they're coming back. Live for those 10 people, feed those 10 people. And then satisfy with that like that's how i see it like it doesn't always have to keep growing and growing and growing and at the same time however if growth is a concern for you with the 10 people please encourage them to tell 10 other people <laughs> like i like to work the audience right let them do the work for you if they believe that your work is so amazing like there's always going to be some people who are like oh i've been following your work i love you so much and then i always say well do you tell anyone about my work <laughs> And I'm like, if there's, if they say no, I'm going to like, then you don't really love it that much. You need to start telling everyone, put it on your social, do the stuff. So basically what I'm saying to you is get the people to work for you instead of you feeling like you need to do the work. That's what I'm saying. I'm seeing a Breck hair commercial right now. <laughs> 
and they tell their friends and they tell their friends and they tell their friends. Um, but I do like this idea that it doesn't even matter what the size is because if they're committed, which goes back to Carrie Ann's point earlier, you didn't necessarily want an enormous audience. You just want to do what it is that you do. Um, and sometimes it reaches further and sometimes it doesn't. Carrie Ann or Michelle, do you want to add anything to that? I could, I could say something about sort of, well, first of all, like, you know, um, uh, that's kind of the reality of uh, most of the poets <laughs> in this country. But, but that, that also comes down to the other, the, the comment that, I mean, I think you were just talking about this as well, is the idea that are we doing, uh, why are we doing what we're doing? And I, I, I think, um, you know, the arts-based research that, 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 that I've come to understand um, and frame what, what I do, I wouldn't, you know, is, is about the doing. It's about the understanding the research, understanding the stories, understanding um, the concepts that I'm dealing with in, in a deeper way. So I wouldn't necessarily frame it as knowledge mobilization. I feel like that's, uh, that is looking for the audience for something there, but this, this, this creative engagement I have is, is um, its own process for me. And I would do it regardless of, um, uh, you know, of, you know, it, it getting a large audience or, or um, a small one, as long as it got the audience that it really resonated with it, it, it because for me, the process um, at this point uh, is everything. Not saying I don't want a, a great audience for anything that I've written, but, um, uh, it's the process that's changed me. It's the process in which I've found healing. It's the process in which I've found excitement and 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 new understanding of um, uh, the research that I'm doing and 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 the research, other people's research that I'm working on. Marianne, just just to echo Michelle, I think even if it's the same ten people following you around different forms, the different forms may be able to introduce a different kind of engagement. A different kind of conversation or language to talk about the thing, right? And I think that that's also very worthwhile. So, so in fact, the different form changes the conversation in some sort of way. Perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. Um, that links really well, Carrie Ann, to another question from the audience from Emma Kiburkstis. Um, I love seeing so many people with such a range of skills and interests, and I'm just curious, how do you choose what to focus on? How do you choose on which medium to present it? Peer reviewed journal versus podcast versus novel. I'm attempting to finish writing my dissertation and keep pushing things off to a not so distant future when I have free time during job search hell. So how do you choose? How do you choose what to focus on? And, and how do you form so someone like Michelle? How do you choose whether it's going to be a, a poem or whether it's a novel or whether it's a memoir? How do you choose? which form of podcast you want to do, Hannah, how do you choose what, what, how, how you're going to approach it? Link short stories versus a novel. How do you choose those things or do they choose you? I could Michelle. begin just by saying in a linear fashion that, um, I started with poetry because I was a PhD student and I didn't have time, uh, to engage, uh, with, you know, um, um, longer works at a time. Um, and I didn't know it then. I didn't know it then. I always, I always wrote poetry in my, in my younger days, you know, poetry I would never show anybody, but <laughs> I always did, but I didn't know it during my PhD years, but not only was, was the academic training as, um, Scary Ann who said that, 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 that without the PhD, her writing wouldn't have happened. So because of the PhD, I chose poetry as my major form throughout that time. And, sh and shortly after, but that was training me for the nonfiction I moved into. And I chose nonfiction next, um, partly because there's an amazing discipline in working within the parameters of, um, of, of facts that, that, you know, verifiable, in a sense, verifiable facts and, and how you're playing with those and how that becomes a part of your story and the other stories that you're telling. So. Uh, but also, I, I was telling those in short spurts. So again, that was a lot of I, the kids, younger kids, fractured time, um, and an ability to sit in that and not be as immersed as I'm finding I need to be for the novel. But I could not, I honestly could not write the novel without the PhD, without the poetry, and without the nonfiction experience. This novel is combining all of that experience, and I'm 
you know, I, I, I would have wanted in a slightly, you know, to have had a novel out in, in, you know, a different point in my life. However, I couldn't have written it without all of this stuff. So for me, it was a process of building um, um, skills and, and uh, ways of thinking, um, knowledge of genre and knowledge of uh, the topics that I'm playing with. And that took um, just time and um, figuring it out based on, you know, the reality of my life and um, um, you know, what was open at the time, really. So it was very practical in a sense. <laughs> Thank you with that. Who else wants to add to, to add to that conversation? Cheryl. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say for myself, you know, I, as much as I'm a, I consider myself to be a creative person, I'm also a very technical person. <laughs> Like, I like that that's that's why I still do a lot of academic writing because I actually like the rigor of having to be technical and having to 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 check every box and, and say certain things within that. But what I what I also realized is that with the technical writing part of it, the creativity is how to put yourself. Your authentic self into that technical frame. And so if people read my work, which, you know, people have read my work and if it's an academic article, the beauty in a box is an academic book. Uncle is a, is a nonfiction book. They're kind of like, it's like almost the same. <laughs> it's like, it all kind of feels a bit the same, even though the form is a little bit different and it's because I found a way to find my voice. So the form really doesn't matter. I could, I could take up painting and they'd be like, this is just like beauty in a box. It's like, actually it's a painting. <laughs> So it's not, <laughs> but be because it, because it, the form is, is irrelevant to me. It, it, like, I don't even think of it. I think of my authentic voice. I think of the, the technical things that I like about writing and creating anything. And then I actually think of the best for me, the form that it takes is really thinking about dissemination. Like, what's the best way to get this idea out? And sometimes you need an academic article to really give that full story like i need to i need 30 pages to tell you this topic basically i can't do this in a two minute video it's it's just too surface where certain things i'm like you know what this would actually be a really great op-ed because i just have a, a one track opinion that i want to give and i don't have anything else to say about it so it, it it really is about at the end of all that the different forms I'm t for me it's about that authentic voice and and once you find your voice I feel like I almost look at Maya Angelou, you know, like Maya Angelou, think about all the things she did. She danced, she sang, it was fiction, nonfiction. She act, she was an actor, she was a public speaker. Like she did all these things, but Maya Angelou was in every single one of those elements, right? And 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 you could see her in it and she wasn't pretending. So I think that to me is is part of the journey of not just being an academic, but being a, anyone who produces something for public consumption. I love that relation, that idea of saying that your voice has to be present. However, it is, whatever form it takes, your voice has to be finding your voice as part of it. Um, and now we've moved from the, from, from the stuff you've written, your high, cheap, high thread count to what's on your wall, the art that's on your wall. We've got your whole house by the end of this. We'll have your whole house decorated, which is excellent. Uh, <laughs> carry on and Hannah, did you want to add anything to this? I, I forgot the question even. So I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just rolling with this. I love it. I think the story finds it tells me how to how to tell it, you know. And to me, I think a lot of it is just a story, whether it comes, you know, whether it's academic or it's fiction or it's nonfiction. Even like the stitching that I started to do, which is visual, it's a story. And um, God, I wish I was a dancer. Like if I could do my life again. That would be part of my repertoire for sure. Um, yeah, like, I just think that there's so many ways in which to express the ideas. And as Cheryl's saying, the, the knee is present, right? In all of it. And it's like, it's play. It's just, it's playing and, and I love it. So. I love the idea of play and centering play because what you've all talked about, you've talked about joy. You've talked about love. You've talked about passion. You've talked about play and those are really quite wonderful ways to think about the work that it is that we do, whether we do it as quote unquote, traditionally scholarly, or if we move outside of that box. Anna, do you want to add yeah. anything? Yeah, I, mean, I was just thinking that 
I tried so many other approaches before I found podcasting. And so part of it was the willingness to experiment, to just be like, I'm just going to try a bunch of stuff. Um, and like take up, you know, I took up a lot of opportunities. I went to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute like six times. Like I just kept going and being like, maybe I'll do this thing. No, nope, I'm not going to. Maybe I'll do this thing. Nope, bored by that. So like I would do it for a week. Um, and I'm a real classic Gemini. Like I get really into a thing. I'm like, this is my life. And then a week later, I'm like, forget it. I never cared about that. And I never will again. And podcasting stuck. Um, and it it did for me end up being the space where, where Astro was saying, where I think I started to find my authentic voice that I can now bring into my writing and into other work that I do, having found a medium that worked for me as a space to, to, to find that thing. But um, it really was about just being willing to like, try, just try a bunch of stuff, be willing to maybe be bad at it and look a little silly when you do it because you're not very good at it. Um, but just like, am I, wait, is it gonna turn out I'm a great interpretive dancer? It's not. It's not going to turn out, but you you kind of have to be willing to to get a little silly and just try it out. I still believe Hannah. I still believe it could be possible to I be mean, an interpretive dancer. Yeah, remember that YouTube theater. So, see, there you go. Remember there was that YouTube competition of like interpretive dance your thesis topic. Yes. And some of the dance your dissertation stuff was amazing. Yes. It's amazing when you see it. I've got, um, I've just had Shannon say, hey, why don't we do the draw now and then continue the conversation? How do you guys feel about that? If we do the draw now for the, for the book prize and then we'll continue the conversation because there is a, definitely one other question I definitely want to ask you all before we go anyway. But so we're going to do the draw now and Shannon is going to do that. She was writing down the names of who was all present. So I'm going to leave it to her. She might have sent me a chat that I didn't see on this, but we'll see if she gets herself on for that. So it's for this and whoever we draw, we'll be able to contact via email and, and mail it to them if they're not in town for the people that aren't in town. So are you there, Shannon? Yes, the winner is Shannon Vickers. Shannon Vickers, excellent. So Shannon Vickers, we will be contacting you via email because I believe we do have everybody's email addresses. Um, we, don't, we do, don't we, Shannon? Yeah, because they registered. So. Yes. yes. So we will contact you via email and we'll find a way to get this to you. Um, uh, and after after tonight's event, um, I'm also seeing a question, um, comment here from Angela Antel saying, I love the concept of embrace the silly and not fearing failure um, on that. OK, I have some other I have one other question I want to ask, but I think there might have still been something in the Q&A. Oh, Shannon says, "Woo, thanks. Um, and uh, Natalie Beausoleil, who is a professor in the Department of Division of Community Health and Humanities, made the comment, thank you so much, all of you, you do fantastic work. I think we still have a lot of work to do within academia or to change academia if we want to work in it or in relation to it. When we do something a bit outside the box, it becomes a challenge at times of application for promotion. I feel fine now to integrate my visual arts practice, autoethnography, et cetera, in my health research, but I had to do a lot of explaining in order to become full professor in medicine. And that is not so long ago. And so I think in relation to Natalie's point there, I guess one of the questions I would have for you is, do you feel that certain topics, subjects, or disciplines lend themselves more to creative approaches than others? What would you say? I'm just gonna say yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't hurt that I am faculty at the creative school. <laughs> like that pretty much opens the door for me to do. I could, I could become a clown and they would say, look how she's interpreting beauty through clown. I could do anything because I'm in that rubric. And to be quite honest with you, that is what attracted me to the job in the first place, because I had been a session instructor at traditional universities, teaching in traditional departments. And every time, believe me, there's a lot of history departments who remember me because I had applied for every history job I could, and I never got even a long list. Okay. <laughs> now they're thinking, oh, dang it, but you missed the boat. And why? Because I didn't fit. 
because a lot of these disciplines, they still have very rigid criteria for what qualifies as being quote unquote, a historian, a sociologist, even in English, um, very rigid. And so I think, but at the same time, their students, the students are desiring to reimagine a lot of those disciplines. And it's like right now, um, to Natalie's point, you know, I actually think the university is at a juncture where bottom up, they're asking for a lot of change, not just in terms of quote unquote EDI, whatever that means, but literally in terms of the very concept of thought and knowledge and why you're in university in the first place is actually being brought to the table that young people are really thinking what is the what not just what is the point of this degree to get a job but what is actually the the point of learning this topic at this moment in time like what is it actually what are we even contributing to the world forget getting a job and i think paradoxically you have academic departments that are still like yeah let's get the tenure file and help me act. like it just seems so it's like it's disconnected there's like a disconnectedness in the university. So I just think, you know, I'm lucky enough to be at this so-called creative school, but I can tell you, and I say so-called because if I was in a different department, I honestly think knowing myself as I am, I would be doing the exact same thing. <laughs> it's just that I would be fighting people a lot more in terms of how I validate what I'm doing. And I think um, to Natalie's point, you've, you've actually hit on the, the issue of our times for sure. You're nodding, Hannah. I am. Yeah, I'm I am nodding because I had such a hard time as an English scholar explaining what I did and was told this, right? I went to I was interviewing for jobs and people were like, "We don't understand you." Like cuz you you did a PhD in contemporary Canadian literature and then you did a postdoc in digital humanities and periodical studies and you, now you're making a podcast about Harry Potter. They're like, those things have nothing to do with each other. And I was like, ah, but I care about them all. And it wasn't until I found a publishing studies department and they were like, everything you do is publishing studies. And I was like, cool, great, glad to hear it, delighted. Um, but they're really what, like in this department, I am really free to experiment with how I do my work because that is explicitly part of the research mandate of this department. So I don't have to fight and because I don't have to fight, I have a lot more energy to actually just do work that I think is interesting um, because the fight takes up a lot of your energy, which is why I am trying to make part of the work that I do building infrastructure so that people who are in disciplines where they do have to fight maybe can do a little less of the fighting and a little more of the just making the thing. Um, but I do think a lot of conventional disciplines are really, really attached to the norms of how knowledge is produced and evaluated, um, particularly when it comes to tenure and promotion as a process. All right, Carrie Ann, you want to share something? I, I was just going to say it's it's so ironic like when I was doing my PhD it was I would like apply to go to Canadian studies conferences and and they would be like no because what are you <laughs> right? like what is it that you're doing we don't call that Canadian studies and um and most recently I saw a posting in Canadian studies which is now really wanting the kind of work that I did, you know, 13 years ago. And it's also included research creation as counting towards what they would see as a publishing record and as, as intellectual work. So I thought that was really interesting because then suddenly for the first time, after all these years, I can maybe see myself squeeze in, maybe if they're actually serious about it, <laughs> about research creation. Um, so I think that, I think, yeah, like, I think what Cheryl said is really true. Like there's, there's something, there's friction happening. There is something that is happening that we may see shifts, hopefully, because we need it, right? Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, I just want to say that I, I'm seeing the change uh, as well. And 
I, I'm seeing it right now as, as you know, the, the postdoctoral work I've been able to do, which I, I have been able to combine arts creation, arts based research with um, uh, supporting traditional research as well. But when I have, you know, taken a step further in um, uh, even, even looking at, uh, uh, you know, interviewing for jobs that may have, um, you know, expressed an interest in creative approaches or arts creation. Um, there seems to me, I interpret some of what goes on, some of the questions that there's a divide in departments quite often. You have the people who are on board, who want this change to happen. But you also have the people and who are on the hiring committees who will go, well, wait, 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 you know, you wrote this book and it's, you know, what does that count? <laughs> how does that, how does that count? And are you going to waste all our time writing a novel instead of, <laughs> instead of teaching, right? So, but. So I really see that although we're at a time of, of, I think, as they say, huge demand, there's still, you know, there's still a bit of pushback and that departments as a whole haven't been able to come together behind it. But that, uh, and, and certainly not everywhere, there's some great, great, great places. Um, but, uh, but that, you know, it's a struggle in some places still. It's a struggle between how do we evaluate? How do we control? Um, how do we know that this person is doing you know, this work that we can approve of um, and, and um, you know, having that, uh, just trusting that creative work and knowing that the creative work is that knowledge system in itself. I like your point there around um, how do we evaluate? How do we control? Which I think Cheryl brought up that point earlier around evaluation and control. I'm not gonna ask the rigor question because I hate the rigor question. So I'm not gonna ask a question about rigor. Um, Hannah, you wanted to say something, and then I've got one last final lightning round after that. Just one real small note on top of that. I'm going through the tenure process right now, and I have to say that the more of us who do this, like this weird work, the easier it is for junior scholars to do this because there's more people to write tenure letters for you. So it's like really worthwhile for all of us to keep doing the weird stuff because we, in a very real way, because of the structure of academia, we build capacity the more we do it. A very important point. Absolutely. The more, the, the more those of us who are already in spaces can create spaces for others to come after us is very, very important. Um, my last lightning round is that I'm sure there are people, and I know there are people listening, thinking it's all fabulous, but how do I get started? I want to, I want to get involved with this kind of stuff. How would you how, what would you say to a researcher who really wants to stretch beyond their usual boundaries about how to start? They're not quite sure how to do it. But also, what would you say to the creative practitioner who says, actually, I want to build more research into my work and I want to work more with, quote unquote, more traditional research. So it, we're at 845 now. So I guess that gives you like two and a half minutes each to come up with what you would say to someone who says, I want to do this stuff, but I don't know where to begin. Cheryl, I'll be very brief because I actually get approached about this all the time. <laughs> like I have a lot of creative people who like, I really want to begin into academia and vice versa academic academics. You say, you know, I want to, I want to be really creative. And, and what I say to them is just do it. <laughs> like, what do you want from me? <laughs> like, I can't tell you what your practice should be. Just do something. I say that because what often the reason why people are paralyzed is because they think there's some magic formula <laughs> or there's some secret handshake or something. It's like, there no, is a secret handshake. There's no secret handshake. And if it is, it's anti-black because I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. That's my, that's my story, <laughs> but it's true. It's like, just do it. I'll, la last thing I'll say in my last minute, if you go to a, a group of five-year-olds and you give them some crayons, you don't have to explain to them <laughs> what they need to do with the crayons. They just start making stuff. And I think we need to channel our inner five-year-old and just start making stuff. And to Hannah's point, some of it will be really bad and that's okay. So it's circle back to what we've been saying about play, taking chance, chances, risk, also reinventing your sense of self that maybe if you see yourself as one thing when you start playing through the process you might become something else and being okay with that something else a lot of times people are afraid of being an artist 
because they think an artist looks like this, whatever that is. Just lean in and have some fun. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Michelle and Hannah. All right, I just um, I just wanted to say actually build upon what uh, what Charles said and, and and say be willing to make yourself uncomfortable. Go to spaces that make you uncomfortable. So for the artists looking to add research, go to places where researchers, academics, people who aren't writers but who are doing other things, um, go to places. Uh, where they're at, listen to them talk, interact, audit a class, <laughs> um, interact with them. And, but for the academic wanting to start, um, again, that's also go into the, you know, pick up a writer's workshop. A lot of academics work really well with other people and really get excited with being with other people. So work alone, but, but, but today, so, you know, so take a little workshop, take a weekend workshop, bring your, bring your research with you, find out what 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 excites that writer at the workshop about what you're doing because sometimes you're so deep in it you don't see the exciting part of it but another writer or another artist will go wow that's amazing and then you'll know where to start great thank you with that anna i mean yes to everything everybody else has said um and also what i'm going to say is is start small um i think as academics we have a tendency sometimes not only to want everything we do to be perfect right out the gate, which I think what Cheryl was pointing to that, like, tell me how to do it so I get it right and don't look silly. Like, too bad. You, you part of the deal of this is you gotta get it wrong and look silly sometimes. But also, it's like, okay, I'm gonna do a podcast. So, step one, apply for a shirt grant. Like, nah, dude, step one, just make something, just try something and like maybe take like, an article you published recently and try to make a zine out of it or take the book that you're working on and try to make a like one minute podcast episode about it. Like just, just play and keep it, keep it small and keep it, you know, experimental for a while as you figure out like what is fun for you and what sort of fits the shape of the kinds of things you're, you're trying to say. Um, you don't, you don't have to start with a, with a insight grant. Famous words to another mantra to live by. You don't have to start with an insight grant. Very important. Carrie Ann. I want that on a t-shirt. You should be walking around with that. Who do you think you are? You don't start with a shirt grant. Um, I think I have three things to say. Like ditto, ditto, ditto to what everybody else said. But also, like, as scholars and as creatives and as both, we have curiosity. I think that that's our greatest skill, right? We have curiosity and we're good learners. Like, we're good learners and we're curious and we are meant to be scared shitless. Like, I'm scared all the time, um, all the time. And I love it because that's the risk, right? And the, and the payoff is so fun um, and so satisfying. So I just, just like, do it, just do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. All of you just do it. We've all become a Nike ad now, <laughs> an alternative at Nike ad. Uh, we've come basically to the end of our time together. Um, and it's really been a great night. I've really enjoyed it. And I know other people have as well. I wanted to share a couple comments. This is a comment from Siobhan McManamy, um, who says no question for you this evening, but plenty of excitement and affirmation. Yes to unburdening curiosity. Yes to process as purpose. Yes to creative new forms. Yes to accountability and accessibility. Yes to value centered work. Yes to undisciplined undisciplining disciplines. Congratulations to all of you and thank you for sharing your work with all of us. Um, Siobhan is the senior editor at Wilfrid Laurier University Press, um, and she is a most exciting senior editor. Um, so uh, it's quite wonderful to have her voice here. Uh, Natalie says, Natalie Beausoleil says, thank you. I agree with Cheryl that students are hungry for arts-based research, imaginative work and approaches. And you're all right, we're at an important juncture. Um, and Shannon Vickers says, thank you all. And I wanted to say thank you for coming tonight and participating and for all of your energy and your enthusiasm. Thank you also to Sheila and Heather, our interpreters. Thank you to Shannon and Sheridan, our GAs. 
and to the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences for their support of the Nexus Center. And thank you to all of you who have been in the audience um, for this whole evening and for your questions um, along the way. Thank you for joining us for this Research Week event. And thank you, Sonia. It was a huge pleasure. Thanks for bringing us together. It's been a blast. It's been so much fun and I wish we could have done it in person. Although I appreciate how many more people we can reach in this forum as well. Next time, next time we'll be at a bar. <laughs> we will laugh a lot next time. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>